virus is a blunt reminder that uh, uh, diseases might be emerging. And uh, we have heard the remarkable statement that those people who believe about themselves that they are most protected might actually be the most vulnerable. Why is that so? Well, there, there are three. Go ahead. There are three major vulnerabilities in big cities, and people generally, people in large cities, think that they're very protected from disease. But large cities require a constant inflow and outflow of goods and materials. And that means that the possibility of disease causing organisms coming in and out is always there. And big urban centers are also places where many people are crowded together. So that's a place where if one person gets sick, the chances that that person will contact another person are very high. So in the rural areas where you don't have very many people, it's not very densely populated, people don't come into contact with other sick people that often. And then finally, in, in big cities where you, you think that there are, there's a lot of medical care and a lot of hospitals and a lot of infrastructure that's really going to protect us against disease, and people are highly educated and aware, there's always a subpopulation of people who are poor, who are not very healthy, who are not well educated, and are generally invisible to the city services, the public health service. And those are the people that are usually undernourished, and they're the ones who are most vulnerable to getting sick in the first place. And that's where diseases can come into a city and take hold. I think it's when you bring everything together. Yeah. You bring uh, more area for the mosquitoes to breed and a higher density of people. This is one of the, uh, besides these three items that you're talking about, this is a major problem. So uh, every control has to consider this. Uh, um, uh, sewage system and, and the density of people. That, that we have a, the main problem we have is breeding ground for the mosquitoes. Yeah. For and sick people. So yeah. put these two together. So it seems to me that uh, one of the key concepts here at play uh, is uh, the notion of opportunity. Do we see that uh, in biology, that opportunities are very important for parasite spread? And uh, do we see it today and did we, do, we, do we see it in the past? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, uh, we know that, that, that species or parasites can do a lot more than they actually show. So they use, uh, they use less host species than they actually could use. And it's just not because they don't have the ability to colonize or to use other host species, but because they don't have the opportunity of doing that. If we have, for instance, for the first question, if we have a, a large population and no mosquito, we wouldn't have problems with Zika. The other way around would go the same way, right? So opportunity is part of the entire story about evolution. Uh, the species may have the capacity, but if the opportunity do doesn't present itself, it's not going to happen. If the species cannot change host, it's not going to change. If the species can eat banana, it, can't, it eats banana all, uh, for thousands of years. But it can eat uh, avocado, but avocado is not never available. It's not going to eat avocado. <laughs> That's basically what it is. Does climate change create more opportunities for emerging parasites? What we're seeing with climate change is, is community, uh, species, populations moving around due to changes in the environment. And, uh, and uh, that will give the opportunity to pathogens of one species, get in touch with another species from another community or another population with, uh, uh, that, it ne that never had contact before. So that opens the opportunity for whole switch, if you want to call it. And, and climate change affects everything all at once. So it's climate change doesn't just create new opportunities for pathogens of humans. It's also pathogens of livestock, pathogens of crops, pathogens of any species of plant or animal that human beings rely on economically. Uh, and that's why it's a, it's, a, it's a large problem, because one phenomenon, climate change, can create multiple opportunities for new diseases. I was struck by the fact that uh, 
the notion of complexity plays an important role in the recent explanations. Uh, why uh, do we have this change? Why didn't people realize uh, the importance of this before? Or could they have realized it before? They just missed an opportunity because of historical contingency. What's your view about this? Well, I, I think what happened, and it's a really good, really good question, and I think it, it's really critical because people believed that in localized situations, hosts and parasites, hosts and pathogens, had progressively more and more and more specialized interactions. And in some way, the more specialized the interaction, the, the more restricted we thought the parasite would be. But it turns out that no matter how specialized your interaction can be in one place, that doesn't affect your ability to be a pathogen someplace else. So if you're becoming very specialized on one host in one place, there may still be hosts in other places that are susceptible, but have never been exposed. Yeah, it's, the, it's what you, 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 you say, it's a time bomb waiting to explode. Uh, when I, I always see this as isolated uh, uh, lakes with one species of parasite on one species of fish, simply because that's the only species of fish available with that place. Now, put everything together, then you present other hosts, and the parasite will probably be able to jump around. Parasite, parasite. Um, uh, do large organizations whose job would be exactly that uh, try to keep, keep track of these changes or, uh, or put it in a differently? Um, do we learn enough about our enemies or not? Hmm. Nope. What's the situation? We have no idea about this. Uh, actually, what, what, what this new paradigm, this new idea about parasites or pathogens and hosts, the evolution of these two parts of the bio system um, uh, evolves is that uh, it becomes so closely associated that, that if you kill the vector, the pathogen will disappear. And uh, the, oh, the, the idea we have today about the evolution of these two is that you can kill the vector, but, but, but there, there may be other species in the same environment that are holding a main reservoir for that specific pathogen. So uh, uh, politics will stop, for instance, so an administrator may stop a process of vector control or, or a process of trying to control a certain disease, such as uh, syphilis in Brazil right now, just because HIV is under control because of new treatments. Uh, they remove the, the distribution of condoms to the population and syphilis is coming up. So, uh, I don't think they have any idea how to handle this. Uh, no, the, 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 the biomedical community is governed by a fundamental principle called do no harm. And do no harm in this context means wait until there's an emergency and then try to respond to the crisis. So they, they, they do not anticipate. This is actually amazing because, as far as uh, I understand, already 60 years ago there was a very clear warning by somehow. How did that sound? Because it's actually beautifully crazy. Yeah, 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 yeah. The, 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 the earliest ecologists, like Elton, uh, the North American ecologist, talking about climate change, seeing this beginning to happen in the 1950s, said, one of the biggest impacts of climate change is going to be increased conflict and increased migration. The people and, and you know, their livestock and other species are going to be moving around this planet. They're going to be in conflict. And these kinds of things we are, were, should have been anticipated and paid attention to, and they weren't. So given these uh, false attempts, so to speak, to start thinking in time. Uh, could you give us one or two sentences each? What should we then tell our children? We should learn about the enemy and start planning ahead and not, and not answering as the problem arrives because it's going to be too late if we do that. So I think what we should do is I, I hope we could be able to tell our children that governments and science are working on it. 
and trying to understand what's going on and looking for strategies to deal with this time that we are entering. I think fun fundamentally what we need to do right now is to find them before they find us. We need to be going out and, and looking for the pathogens before they arrive. And so we tell our children that they need to vote for politicians who will support programs like that. Absolutely. Gentlemen, thank you very much. Thank you.